When discussing the subject of religion in the region of Persia, one usually thinks of a strong Islam presence and never really thinks of the idea that Buddhism was once the driving force of religion in that area. However, before the Arabs invaded in the 7th century, the region that now consists of Iran, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and parts of India was indeed a dominantly Buddhist area. It is important to discuss how Persia is a deep part of Buddhist history and has much to do with what Buddhism is today. Through the study of Buddhist presence starting in 500 BC, it becomes evident that the religion did not really have an effect on Persia, but more so the empires and lifestyles that flourished over the 1,000 year span before Islam are responsible for helping Buddhism become what it has. The first ever talked about Buddhist emergence in Persia comes from an ancient 5th, 6th century BC Pali legend. Pali is an ancient Prakrit language derived from Sanskrit, which is the scriptural and liturgical language of Theravada Buddhism. The legend speaks of two merchant brothers from Bactria, which is modern day Afghanistan, who visited the Buddha in his eighth week of enlightenment. These brothers shared a special connection with the Buddha, and in turn, they were named his first two disciples. The Buddha sent his disciples back to the main city of Bactria, named Balkh, to dedicate the rest of their lives to building temples in his honor and to help spread Buddhist thought, Balkh became a center for the spread of Buddhism. The great king Ashoka was an Indian emperor who ruled over the Mauryan Empire from 273 to 232 BC and is credited with the first attempt at implementing a universal policy of Buddhism. In the early parts of his reign as king, he was constantly at war and was feared by all as a vicious, bloodthirsty ruler. Through immense amounts of violence, he conquered hundreds of territories and greatly expanded his empire. In 265 BC, Ashoka's army stormed the eastern Indian state of Kalinga. After being defied by the commander-in-chief of Kalinga's army, Ashoka was furious and unleashed what was then the greatest invasion ever recorded in Indian history. Kalinga put up a massive fight, but they were no match for the powerful armies, superior weapons, and experienced soldiers of Ashoka's kingdom. One day after the conquest of Kalinga, Ashoka ventured into the city and realized that the only remains of Kalinga were burnt houses and scattered corpses. When he returned to his home in Paliputra, the capital of the Mauryan Empire, Ashoka could get no sleep for weeks and was haunted by his deeds in Kalinga. Full of sorrow and remorse, he resolved to refrain from violence permanently. Under the guidance of Brahim Buddha's stages, Radha Swami and Manjushiri, Ashoka took his vows as a Buddhist and decided to dedicate the rest of his life to helping spread the relatively new philosophy throughout his land, even to parts of Rome and Egypt. He sent thousands of missionaries to spread his teachings throughout his northwest territories. Ashoka freed all of his prisoners and went from being known as Chattashoka, Kruel Ashoka, to Dharma Ashoka, and Pious Ashoka. The Ashokava Don or the legend of King Ashoka, tells the story of Ashoka's early feud with violence and describes his transformation into a peaceful man who shared his belief in Buddhism with his people. He built nearly 84,000 stupas and viharas for his followers. Stupas are clay religious monuments, viharas are monasteries. Both are dedicated to the Buddhist teachings. Ashoka pursued an official policy of ahizma, or non-violence, and urged his people to follow in his path. He abolished the unnecessary slaughtering of animals by passing laws banning sport hunting and branding. Although he was hopeful everyone would follow in his footsteps as a Buddhist, he accepted those who refrained from the teachings. Instead of trying to overthrow surrounding kingdoms, Ashoka accepted them as his allies. He also built rest houses throughout his entire empire to house and feed travelers and pilgrims free of charge. The Dharma Ashoka defines the main principles of Dharma as non-violence, tolerance of all sects and opinions, obedience to parents, respect for the Brahmins and other religious teachers and priests, liberality towards friends, humane treatment of servants, and generosity towards all. These principles are what Ashoka preached after taking his vows. They represent a general set of ethics that no religious group or social group could object to, and he believed in them with all of his being. The next people to make their mark on Buddhism in Persia are those of the Greco-Bactrian kingdom. After the demise of the Maurya Empire, the Sunga and Kamba dynasties both ruled briefly before the Greek king of Bactria, Demetrius, conquered Gandhara. His kingdom further developed what Ashoka had started 
and was a major force in the spread of Buddhism throughout Persia. They covered the area of Bactrian and Sagdian, a city that is now part of central India. So it's now 75 AD, and Buddhism has been being spread throughout Persia for nearly 400 years when the Kushan Empire came into power. They ruled over what is now Tajikistan, Pakistan, and northern India, and reached their peak from 105 to 250 AD. For many centuries, they were the center of exchange for the East and West. Merchants and travelers from all lands passed through Kushan territory in their journeys down the Silk Road. Hence, Buddhist thought was carried to the deepest parts of Europe and throughout Central Asia. In their early years, the Kushan strongly encouraged the development of Greco-Buddhism. Greco-Buddhism is a fusion of Hellenistic culture and Buddhism that began when Alexander the Great conquered Asia Minor and Central Asia in 334 BC and was developed over a period of around 800 years in Central Asia. The contributions that the Kushans made in the development of Mahayana Buddhism are undoubtedly their greatest influence. Mahayana Buddhism, along with Theravada, is one of the two main branches of Buddhism. It originated in the Indian subcontinent that is now Pakistan, and the main countries that practice Mahayana today are China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam. Mahayana emphasizes the adoption of new sutras. Sutras are the scriptures containing the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama the Buddha. Unlike the Theravada non-theist tradition, in Mahayana the Buddha is put on a godlike status that is present at all times and in all places, and who is present although hidden in every being. The principles of the Mahayana doctrine are based around the possibility of universal salvation for all beings. It also simplifies the expression of faith for the common Buddhist by offering an alternate route to salvation by having faith and devoting oneself to chanting the Amitabha. The Amitabha is a celestial Buddha discussed in Mahayana scriptures. Amitabha possesses infinite merits resulting from good deeds over countless past lives as a bodhisattva named Dharmakara. Mahayana Buddhism stemmed from Mahayana Buddhism and is often looked upon as the third branch of Buddhism. Mahayana offers an accelerated path to enlightenment through tantric techniques such as the repetition of spiritual phrases, the use of yoga techniques like pranayama, which means breath control, and the use of visual aids such as cosmic mandala diagrams, which teach and map pathways to spiritual enlightenment. King Kanishka was one of the most influential Kushan kings. He built the cities of Taxila at Sursuk and Peshawar, where he built a beautiful array of stupas. He also was around during the peak of Gandharan art. Gandharan art is an amalgamation of Greek, Persian, and Indian art tradition and is the most obvious example of how Persia, more specifically the Kushan dynasty, influenced Buddhism. This was the first instance in which the Buddha was presented in human form. Previously, he was considered beyond the reach of artists. The art flourished during the Kushan Empire and declined after the 5th century White Hun invasion. Peshawar Valley and Taxila are full of ruins of stupas and monasteries from this period. Many Gandharan pieces are dedicated to the Jataka tales of the Buddha's former lives. The tales represent different ways of showing selflessness. Gandharan sculptures are considered some of the most brilliant sculptures ever and can even be seen at the University of Wisconsin, Madison's very own Chazen Museum of Art. King Kanisha's empire stretched from Bengal to Central Asia and became known as the Kingdom of Gandharan. He was a great patron to the faith of Buddhism and spread Buddhist thought through Central Asia and the Far East over the Pamir, where he met the Han Empire of China. The Kingdom of Gandhara became the center of the civilized world, and in Gandhara, Mahayana Buddhism flourished, and for the first time the Buddha was truly being represented and worshipped in human form. Gandhara was the holy land of Buddhism and attracted Chinese pilgrims to see the wonderful Jataka monuments. After Kanishka, the Kushan began losing territories in the east and eventually was overthrown by the Sasanian Empire in 241 AD. Prior to their arrival, Buddhism had never really met much opposition from rival religions. Sasanians declared Zoroastrianism their religion, and for the first time, Buddhists saw enemies. They prosecuted Buddhists and burnt down Buddhist temples. Some Buddhist communities, like Sistan, Baluchistan, and Khorasan, still secretly practice Buddhist teachings. 
Although Persia today is known as the strongest representation of the Islam religion, for hundreds of years Buddhism flourished, spread, and developed under Persian rule. One now sees that kings of Ashoka and Kanishka and empires like the Kushan dynasty have given more to Buddhism than Buddhism ever has to them. They helped develop Mahayana Buddhism, implemented the first national policy of Buddhism, and Gandharan art may be the most recognized of the Buddhist religion. Without the impact of Persian Buddhism, it may have never become the religion that we study.